Let me start off by welcoming everybody. Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum, special Halloween edition. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the cat herder for it and your host for the next hour. I'm very glad to see so many of you here today to discuss a very, very interesting idea. The next 55 minutes are entirely conversational. I'm going to show you one slide because it's a really nifty one uh, that our guest provided. But other than that, it's been entirely conversations, question and answer. There are no pre-canned slides here, no pre-canned presentations. This is all about you, about the interest you have, about the ideas, the challenges, the problems, the topics, the hopes that you have. So please use either that question mark or the chat box or that raised hand to join us and ask questions. Now, speaking of asking questions, let me just bring up on stage um, our two guests. And uh, these are two wonderful people who both work in leadership roles in EDUCAUSE. So let me bring them both up so you can see them. First, let me welcome Malcolm Brown. Malcolm, greetings. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, my pleasure. Where are you today? Am I, am I seeing sunny New Hampshire? No, you're seeing Rainfield, New Hampshire. It's raining cats and dogs here. Uh, but it's not snowing yet. It is not snowing yet. All right. All right. Very good. We'll have to do. And let me welcome Susan Gryak. Susan, where are you today? Hi, Brian. I am in my home office in Connecticut, and it's very rainy here. Um, and you can see if you look on my wall that although I don't, I'm not dressed up for Halloween, um, I'm a dog lover. And those are two paintings that my husband did of, of our dogs. Good. Well, I'm glad to see all of that. And um, do you, you too, I mean, as colleagues, I mean, do you know that... Um, Susan, you send weather to Malcolm? I mean, is this a typical thing? Only the bad weather. She only sends the bad weather in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Malcolm. Go away. <laughs> Man, this is New Hampshire. This is New Hampshire all over, I've got to say. <laughs> uh, well, let me just welcome. I'm, I'm so glad to see both of you here. I am really appreciate your time. And I'm really excited about this uh, this project that you've started up. Um, just um, just to begin, let me just ask you really quickly as a way of introducing both of you to the few people who don't know you. What are each of you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects, the big topics that are going to be occupying your brains? You want to go first? Oh, okay. You okay. go first, Susan. All right. All right. Well, um, I, I really am uh, going to be working a lot on digital transformation. I think that there is a lot that Educause hopes to do to be able to help our, our members and the community understand what the heck digital transformation is and what it isn't, which is something that, that we're gonna be talking with you about today. And to give you materials to, for, for you to really be able to learn more about it and to think about how it might apply to your job, to your institution, and then to try to develop some initial resources to help you actually embark on, on the digital transformation journey of, of your choice. So that's that's what I'm most excited about. Um, I just finished the first draft of the 2020 Top 10 IT Issues article mm. um, and was, was, was working with, I was working on an infographic today and just proved to um, myself uh, that I, I am no artist, uh, but, but anyway, sketched things out. And uh, then uh, developing some ideas that are kind of related to digital transformation and where higher education might be heading and, and how to think about that. So that's what I'm most excited about, but I'll also be doing all that, all that work that we do in, in our regular jobs um, that may not be glamorous or interesting to talk about, but certainly keeps, keeps things uh, running. It so. does, and I'm glad to hear about all of it. Um, thank you, Susan. Yeah. Malcolm, how about yourself? What's the next year hold for you? Um, well, let's see. Uh, like with Susan, I'll be working on our digital transformation project, particularly with its ramifications for the teaching and learning side of the house. Um, I'll be working on the Horizon Report. The Horizon Report is a sort of never-ending project. When you finish one, then you start work on the next one. So we'll be finishing up the 2020 report and uh, announcing it and launching it at the ELI annual meeting in early March, and then we'll start on the next round. Um, so that's been a very, very interesting uh, project. We're also uh, working on version three of the Learning Space Rating System, and that work will spill over in the 2020. And we also hope to announce that at the EI annual meeting. Um, those are just a few of the things that will keep me occupied and out of trouble. 
When is the uh, ELI meeting? The ELI meeting is March uh, 2nd to the 4th. Our location will be Bellevue, Washington, which is right across the water from Seattle. And then Susan, when does the uh, new top 10 list come out? Um, it comes out uh, mid-January. We already previewed it at the annual conference, so it is coming out there. And anybody who wants to see uh, a preview can download the slides from the Educause uh, uh, website, or you can just shoot me an email, and I'd, I'd be happy to, to send them to you. So, oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've had you as a guest before talking about that really indispensable list, so I'm glad to see it continue. Thanks. Thanks. Well, friends, um, I, I promised I would break habit and actually show a slide, and this is because uh, the two of you spent a lot of time developing the slide, and it's a rich one. I wanted to get people to think, what the heck is digital transformation? And uh, here's the image that, that you gave me. Let me just put this on the screen so everyone can see it. So why, why don't you two kick us off by talking us through this slide? What does all of this mean? Sure, I, I'd be happy to, Brian, and um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're defining digital transformation. Um, we've also got a little icebreaker question that you know we'd love to to ask. So while while I define it, I'll just queue up the question for you all, and then um, after you've sort of uh, listened to me and looked at the definition, we'd we'd love to hear you weigh in. Uh, and what we'd really like to know is. We'd like to know uh, whether or not your institution feels the need to change its strategic priorities, its business model, or its value proposition in order to stay relevant or maybe even solvent in the 21st century. So we'd sort of like to know uh, where, your, where your minds are at uh, regarding that. Um, okay. This is a question that, that the media asks actually when, when they interview us, you know, they're sort of curious, do they know what's going on? So, so anyway, we, we'd like you to think about that and we're really excited about hearing your answers. But let, let me just narrate this slide. Uh, and what we have found is we have found that it, one of the things that's very helpful with digital transformation is that it's really useful to see it in context. So um, when, when we've gone out and we've talked about it, Malcolm and I and, and Betsy Reinitz, our colleague, and Karen Wetzel, uh, we're kind of the gang of four who've been uh, really working on it the most within Educause. But when we go out and we talk to people about digital transformation, one of the things that we've done is we've said, well, what is digital transformation? And they uh, they've said things like, well, it is um, it's it's efficient use of the technology that's available to us hmm. is hmm. getting rid of paper mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. automation. Let's stop the manual madness. Uh, it's information anywhere all the time. Uh, it's getting connected to Gen Z because they're digital natives. Mm -hmm. it's rethinking how we provide service to our students in an innovative way. Those are some examples of, of when we, we don't show the definition, but we just ask people, those are the top of mind thoughts. Um, and and, and we, we would agree with some of those definitions. We would say that some of them are approaching what we believe digital transformation is and has to offer. And yet we would say that many of them are really a little bit earlier in that maturity journey. And uh, if, if, if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll have the hubris of talking about the, um, uh, the, the journey that, that we've been on in higher education and in other industries uh, um, over the last several decades with technology as um, perhaps three different revolutions or three different waves of an overall digital revolution. And the, the first wave uh, was really about digitization. And that was uh, taking paper and photos and sounds and and other um, analog forms of information and digitizing them putting them online and um, I'm, I'm certainly old enough to, to remember when a lot of that was happening mm -hmm. um, and and that was that was really really exciting you know look um, we, we can store words um, online I, I remember my master thesis, I typed in in one of the early word processors, WScript, uh, for those of you 
who might remember that. And it was just so thrilling to be able to sit down with my dissertation, my, my master's thesis advisor. And she would say, would you mind just changing this paragraph? And she came from the days when everything was on a typewriter. And if you changed a paragraph, you might have to retype the whole chapter. And, you know, it was just groundbreaking for me to say, no problem. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it was a very exciting time and, and, and we learned how to, how to use images and, and words and things like that in ways that felt very innovative at the time. That was the digitization phase. That was the digitization phase, really moving information from analog to digital. Then the next phase of this revolution that we're in is um, a, a fussy word, I think it's fussy, digitalization. Mm -hmm. um, and digitalization is more than just let's try to uh, eke, uh, work in an extra syllable to this word, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a useful distinction from digitization because digitalization is saying we've got the data online, we've got it in digital format. Now we want it to move and interact with one another. And so it's really about creating digital processes with the digital information that you have moving data. And that that was a lot of work that, you know, we, we all probably remember um, and are still working on in, in many ways uh, uh, in the services that we provide. Uh, you could you could say that the ERP revolution was a revolution or, or the ERP uh, era was yeah. an era of digitalization um, and really getting the data in these systems to move so that we could pay people and uh, and and order things and understand who our students were and uh, take grant proposals, for example, and submit them uh, to, to fun funding agencies and the like. And those are all some examples of what digitalization is. Well, in, over, the, over the last really 10, 15 years, and probably not much longer than that, and maybe arguably less, technology has evolved to the point where we can do even more things with information than to get it to be digital and to get it to move and interact. But we can actually radically rethink the way we deliver um, teaching, the way we learn and experience learning, the kinds of research that we do, and, and, and the way we can personalize digital experiences and information so that they can really be more relevant to us as individuals. Digital transformation overlaps a lot with the analytics revolution, um, and, and, and there's, uh, there, there, there is a lot to, to, to the extent that um, analytics is letting us manipulate vast data stores and draw um, uh, conclusions and inferences and maybe even um, uh, make some predictions uh, from them uh, and, and to help inform decisions. Uh, that, that, that is a lot of the digital uh, transformation journey, but that's not entirely it. And so our definition of digital transformation is on that slide, but I'll, I'll read it to you. It's uh, digital transformation in EDUCAUSE's estimation is a series of deep and coordinated shifts in culture, workforce, and technology. And those shifts are enabling new educational and operating models and helping transform an institution's operations, strategic directions, and value proposition. So oh, it's leading to a set of outcomes that are unfolding. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, we've had some ideas of potential outcomes, but a lot of the outcomes um, really remain to be, to be viewed and seen and, and imagined. Um, but we believe that the outcomes can change the way, as I said, learning is experienced and education is delivered. We'll be able to um, change what research we're able to do, um, perhaps uh, create entirely new disciplines of research and techniques. Um, change the way institutions operate and the way they connect with learners and the community um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, researchers and, and the way they connect one another. So we, we think uh, it's, it's really quite dramatic. 
um, as I said, we think that there are three primary components to going on a digital transformation journey. One is changing the institution's culture. Uh, and uh, we, we've got an, an, a nice set of signals that you can look at around is your culture changing, what it meant. Um, the other is that it's going to change the workforce. It's going to change jobs. Um, some jobs are going to go away. Some are going to um, morph some new jobs and, and roles are, are going to come into play. And then obviously the changes that we think of right away, uh, which, which are all the technology changes. So um, this is what we think is happening. Um, and and I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing before, before I pause and invite um, reflection and reaction. And that is that this wasn't just me and Malcolm and Betsy and, and Karen kind of sitting there on our own um, in a smokeless room um, coming up with this definition. We actually commissioned the task force of our members. And uh, Malcolm uh, was one of the facilitators of that task force. And they thought long and hard and deep uh, about what digital transformation is. And this definition uh, was, was developed by them. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us the backstory of, of how that was created. And I appreciate the networked origin of it, the community origin of it. And thank you for walking us through this very large concept, this very large model. Uh, before before I go further with any more questions, let me just ask everybody, um, please uh, ask us your questions. Uh, what do you think about this sequence? Um, what do you see as some of the opening promises and potential of uh, digital transformation? Are you seeing any signs of this on your campus or is your campus still stuck in digitalization or even still digitization? Um, let us know, we'd love to hear from you. So please uh, bring up your questions and either click the raised hand button uh, if you'd like to join us on stage, or just click the question mark and type in a question. We'd be glad to hear from you. Um, I have a, a, a quick question that came in from Twitter um, from uh, the wonderful friend of the program, George Station, who unfortunately this semester is teaching right this hour. Um, fortunate for his students, unfortunate for me. Um, and he has a, a question. He wants to know um, about the... Um, he refers to an Educause Review article um, by Alden Keynes and um, another, a colleague who talks about students and the role of student data uh, in digital transformation. And he wonders, how can student agency and privacy become a real part of a digital transformation conversation rather than being an add-on? I'm happy to take this, but do you want to take this, Malcolm? I don't want to dominate the conversation. Well, yeah, or, I mean, there's a lot of ways you could take that one. Um, you know, part of the, the challenge with this concept of digital transformation, it, it turns out to be pretty slippery and to some extent relative. What one institution might think is digitally transformative for itself may not be in the eyes of yet another. Um, I think, though, that that comment has touched on a nerve, I think that the impetus to transform and the ways that institutions are transforming perhaps are most visible and conspicuous in relation to their students. I think there's been a real sea change in higher education. I know from institutions I've been in at the past, students were valued, yeah, kind of, sort of, but, you know, research kind of comes first, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that higher ed has realized that students <laughs> have an important role to play in the future of higher education in their institution. And that's one area where I think um, there is a lot going on that really can be called a transformation. And Susan, yeah, I, I, yeah, Susan, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been thinking about this and I, I think that a, a big component of, a, digital transformation is going to necessarily be developing um, our principles and standards uh, and, and, and supports around digital ethics. Uh, mm. Because mm. As, as we use analytics and as we use student, student data for more and more consequential things, um, the, 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 the privacy risks and the ethical challenges just get more and more serious and you know we've all we've all started to see examples about that as well um and you know you could you could kind of be naive and say 
well, heck, you know, Amazon and Netflix and, you know, name your favorite store. Um, they're using my personal data all the time to, to try to sell to me. And so why should higher education be different? Well, I think it should be different for a couple of reasons. And one is that students aren't, they aren't buying a degree. They're buying a future um, when, when they come to our institutions. And we need to really think carefully about how we can help them uh, uh, thoughtfully um, prepare for that future. And then the other thing is that um, higher education is, is a noble mission, as I've said before, and we are a trusted industry Although certainly if you look at Gallup and other data, uh, the trust mm -hmm. in us is decreasing um, as it is with, with, all, um, with, with all different um, institutions and industries. Um, but I think that we are held to a higher standard and we should be grateful. We should take mm -hmm. the badge of honor. So Brian, let me just add one other comment in here is that uh, I'm grateful that Susan mentioned that the, you know, what a huge role that data is playing now. However, I would go back to something George Seaman said years ago when learning analytics was just taking off. He said, the interesting part of learning analytics is what you do once the analysis is done. You've collected the data mm -hmm. and you've analyzed the data. So what happens next based on what you've analyzed? So here in this definition in this slide that you showed, uh, one of the things I think that's important is that you can have lots of data and lots of analysis, but it's not influencing your institution's strategic directions or its value proposition then it might not be quite in the ballpark of what we're looking at as, as institutional or digital transformation. Same thing with student input. If your student input isn't contributing to discussions around those big institution-wide issues that we're all struggling with right now, um, it may be very useful, but it may not be quite in the domain of digital transformation, which doesn't mean it's not important. It just means it's not quite there. So all depends on how the, all these inputs are being orchestrated and what ends they're serving. So in a sense, I mean, both of you, your your um, answers to George are uh, campuses now are increasingly attuned to student needs and they can use all these different tools to try to bring about uh, better attention to students. I guess the question is, you know, how, what kind of active role do you see students playing in that, um, either in terms of uh, policy or governance or student workers or simply uh, students having a more active role in helping shape their technological environment? Well, one way is certainly, I would say, somewhat passive. I mean, the demographics are shifting in a way that perhaps were not even dreamed of 20 years ago, as we're seeing the dec decline of the traditional higher ed undergraduate and the growth in the number of non-traditional ones. In fact, the usual adage is today is that majority of students who are seeking um, uh, their uh, bachelor's degree, um, all the vast majority of them have at least one non-traditional characteristic. So that whole demographic is shifting, mm -hmm. plus the fact that the way they work with their technology um, is forcing us to shift very things very carefully. How do we support this new diversity of students? Because they're not all of one cloth. They're, very more, they're much more diverse than they have been in the past. So they're forcing these questions to be asked um, on mm. campuses as to how to provide experiences and support and to make the students successful and have a be have a holistic success on their campus. Well, it's a nice change to think about. Um, so let me ask again the rest of you. Um, so this is uh, this is your chance uh, to ask questions about this. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, zoom in to different aspects of it. Um, uh, Susan, in your in your icebreaker question, uh, I tried to paraphrase it, and I think I kind of fumbled around with it. Um, I mean, you were asking about the, how people see this kind of transformation happening on their campus. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and whether whether their campuses uh, at, at their campuses um, uh, leadership and 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 others uh, really feel that that they need to change, um, or are people pretty complacent and they feel like you know, what we're doing today uh, is just really directionally correct and, and we don't need to think about um, making any big changes. Mm -hmm. Well, we have one question that's just popped up immediately from uh, the Austin Kelly Walsh. Let me see if I can bring him on. Uh, Kelly has been a long-term friend of the program as well as a previous guest. Hello, Kelly. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Good. How are you doing in upstate New York, right? Uh, good, good. Doing well. Uh, also rainy. So that, that rain is really covering the Northeast. <laughs> uh, 
Oh my gosh. And hello to Malcolm and hello to Susan. Hi Kelly, how are you? Hey, hi Kelly. Good. So uh, this is a fascinating topic. I um I believe that uh you know all businesses need to digitally transform. You're either ahead of the curve, you're you're running right alongside, or you're behind. And if you're behind, you may go the way of Blockbuster and Borders and BlackBerry and such. Um, but you know one thing that fascinates me, having uh, grown up with this technology and have, have it become my career, um, there's a lot of uh, the economists have been showing that despite all this increase in technology, we don't seem to have measurable increases in productivity. Right. Um, and I sat in a very interesting discussion yesterday, which I learned of the, uh, I don't know if I'm going to say it, but the chondritive uh, wave mm -hmm. shows this 50 year arc of uh, that has happened for quite a bit of history. Um, and he was kind of predicting that uh, 5G will be the thing that will help us kind of really bring things together in a way that hasn't happened and get us on the upswing again because we haven't been. I mean, we've got, which is kind of mind blowing to think of the incredible technology advances in the last 30 years, yet we haven't seen increases in productivity. I'm wondering if anything about that bigger picture has kind of surfaced in your explorations of these ideas at Educause. Mm. Well, just some initial thoughts. I mean, one, it would be really interesting to explore this notion of productivity in the context of higher education and what that kind of might mean. Also, don't you think there's a pattern here? I mean, haven't we been hearing the, the siren call for many, many years? You know, when this technology arrives, everything will be good or improved, right? Mm -hmm. The latest one is probably the 5G example that you just mentioned. There's also been, you know, data and analytics and stuff like that. But I would go back to a comment I made earlier. Um, you know, all this hulking gear and stuff like that isn't really going to help us that much if we're not focused on really what our values are and our direction. Mm -hmm. That's a non-technical, I think that's a non-technical question. So the institution needs to comport itself around these questions and then orchestrate the technologies and say, if we have a direction, how will these help us move in that direction? How will it help us also, what changes do we need to make in our culture? Which is a big thing, right? And that's, you could say, is a non-technical thing. Nope. I think we lost them. Just had a pause there, Malcolm. Um, I'll pick up from there. Coordinated chips. Oh, okay. That. Yeah. Sorry, you just had a hiccup there, Malcolm. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I'll, I, a, a couple of other things that you know, I, I agree with what Malcolm is is saying, and a couple of other things related to that. I was just at the Gartner Symposium in Orlando last week, and that's always a really fun meeting to go to. But I listened to one of the Gartner guys, Mark Raskino. And he gave a talk that was based on uh, uh, what they learned uh, from interviewing and, and surveying CEOs of many, from many different types of industries, um, almost 400, excuse me, almost 500 CEOs. And, and he, he talked about that the CEOs are getting impatient. So kind of, uh, whoops. sorry about that. Um, You're impatient. Yeah, I know. Oh my goodness, it's one of those CEOs calling right now to express your impatience. Um, <laughs> but um, but what what they're getting impatient about, and this is relates to I think some of the things you were talking about, Kelly. They're they're saying, "I w show me the value from mm -hmm. all of these digital investments that I'm making." Um, and Raskino's prescription is not let's just pause, let's step back. His 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 diagnosis is that there's been a lot of he used this great phrase digital dithering going on, digital dithering, and this kind of relates to what Malcolm had, was saying, this lack of focus, right? You know, let's invest in this, let's invest in that, let's do this, let's do that, and 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 he he threw out the idea. Um, which was appealing to us at Educause because now we run the Horizon Report of doing your planning and focusing your planning and your digital transformation work on different digital horizons and thinking of breaking up your digital transformation journey into perhaps several three to four year journeys. So saying, what are we going to accomplish with digital transformation in this initial journey? 
And maybe what we're going to accomplish, and, and this is me filling in now, is maybe we're going to focus on making sure that we've got strong digital foundations and working on some initial culture change and perhaps planning out what are some of the initial directions in which we think the workforce might need to go. Um, and then thinking about what, where, what the next horizon might be and, and, and you know, delaying and, and the, the, the work that might really be sexy and exciting for maybe a, one of the later horizons. So I think this notion of focusing and uh, a, another thought that, that I've been thinking about in relation to this is that we talk about culture or excuse me, we talk about people, process and technology, right? That's the gang of three when, or, or you know, the, the pyramid when, when we think about uh, technology projects and don't start with the technology, start with the people in the process. And I think we need to add a fourth uh, um, piece to that, people, process, technology. But I think we need to start thinking about product uh, and to what outcome. And very often we tend to think of the technology itself as being the outcome. But if we think of the technology as another dimension that can develop a product that we're creating, and that product ought to be a product that the institution is creating. And maybe that product is um, serving adult learners, for example, or uh, developing um, uh, micro-credentials or mm -hmm. something like that. But if we focus on what technologies do we need to be able to get to those products, those real tangible outcomes, maybe that will help us develop um, a sharper, uh, more concrete return on investment that mm -hmm. our presidents and provosts and students and alums can see. Great. Well, thank you for those uh, those thoughts. You know, just just one other thought here. I'll just add here. You know, we use this term digital transformation, and I think the term digital in this phrase is tricky. It can be, if you're not careful, it can be distracting and somewhat misleading in that, you know, if I just haul in all this technology gear, I'll be transformed. And certainly there are lots of people who would like to sell us lots of systems and hardware and have us believe that if we just do the digital thing right, then the transformation will happen. Right. So again, so not to go on at length about this, but that's why we're talking about these deep and coordinated shifts in culture and technology and workforce that are going to point to these uh, more strategic uh, institution encompassing changes. Sure, yeah, it's not a transformation that is digital, it's a transformation enabled by digital. Yes, I mean, and we leave it in there because who can ignore the digital part of this because right. it's so enabling. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's hard, you know, damned if you leave it in, damned if you leave it out a little bit. Sure. Well, thank, you, thank you, Kelly, for the really great question. Thank you both, Susan and Malcolm, for a really great yeah. answer. I love that concept. Is it chondriative ways? Uh, K O N D R A T I E V. Sometimes it's spelled I E F F. Because it's Russian, chondriative. Uh, yeah, really fascinating term. Civilizational waves, and it's a it's a fun thing to look into. I just That's put it uh, on the chat. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, but friends, if you're if you're new to the forum or if you're new to this technology, um, bringing Kelly up on stage was really that simple. So if you'd like to join us on stage, uh, uh, please do. Uh, we have a question from Greg who just had to run out the door. Um, actually, wait, uh, Greg, let's see if your camera's on. I can actually beam you up. Let's see. I thought you were escaping, but now I've got you. Hello, Greg. Yeah, I think we kind of already addressed it. And hi to another Connecticut folks. So um, <laughs> those from Connecticut might know why I'm being a little extra like acerbic in my, uh, my things. Um, but I think you kind of were already getting to this because it's to me, it's it's a human transformation problem. Technology, this has yes. been around for 30 yes. years. This reflects 30 years of bad hiring and firing. Like we can't, I'm, we're not going to buy a tool that's going to fix this. Sorry. I don't know, I guess it's more of a question, but yeah, how do we focus more on the staff development, the people development to you? I mean, we have fact, like, they, they don't use email correctly. I mean, you're talking about, like, and so I, I don't see this digital, I see digital transformation as just a gigantic waste of money on data surveillance tools of students. Sorry, a little bias came out. Yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead, Susan. Well, I, 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 th I think 
I think it's important to share your viewpoint because, you know, if we just like say, what's the party line? Okay, I'll mimic that. Um, we'll never really think carefully about these issues. And if we don't, uh, God help us, right? You know, we're, we're, we're lost. Um, I, I, what, what I'm seeing, uh, I, I, I was able to interview um, a couple of dozen higher ed leaders as part of the IT Issues Project this year. And about half of them were uh, college or university presidents, the rest were provosts and CBOs. And um, they, they know they're on a burning platform. They really, mm. really do. They know they absolutely have to change. So, you know, I think that your point about culture as being the key, I think is a really important one. I, I think that any new technology may or may not make things different, but, but when, when you take all of the financial and reputational uh, challenges, all of the new external competition, um, and, and, and you kind of add all that together, that's when suddenly institutions are willing to make some of those hard and disruptive cultural changes that they wouldn't even have com contemplated before. Um, so and one of, the, one of the reasons we're, we're surfacing this term and trying to engage with the community around this idea yeah. is that, as we all know, and you've both said, that you know, higher ed is experiencing headwinds that it's never experienced before. And in a strength probably that it's never experienced before, which is going to kind of continue on. And I got lots of numbers and stuff that, but we all know about the numbers about the students and things of that sort. Um, so part of our effort uh, is to really try to get the community really thinking about this and taking it seriously. And I myself couldn't agree with you more. We're really talking about the human factors that surround this issue and the human factors in terms of changing the culture, the cultural shift in that triad that we've been talking about is by far the most challenging, I'm sure. Well, that's a that's a great answer. And really, um, Craig, I really appreciate you focusing us on the human aspect of the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, you, you can see this is, um, uh, and thank you, by the way, both uh, Malcolm and Susan. Um, and when we talk about such institutional technological changes and huge frameworks of change, it's important to have the human focus in place and you guys did a really great job of that um, we also had a question from um let's see if i can bring her up from the awesome joyce ogburn and yeah, let's see if we've got her hi um i i i want to uh, really support some of the definitions that you did on digital transformation um, transformation definitely depends on a culture shift. Uh, I'm an anthropologist and I start every framework I do with culture. Uh, yeah. That's where everything comes from, values and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. And another big aspect is behavior. Um, that's the very human and organizational element. And one of the things I've found in addition to um, all the things you need to learn about technology is a lot of times people struggle with technology because they don't even know basic management practices. They don't use sound archival practices. Their everyday work is not well informed. So you add technology on top of that, it doesn't solve that problem. Uh, so people need to be better informed about real aspects of work um, and, and what it takes to do things before they can really use the technology well. I think that's a missing piece. So we can add practice to Susan's list if you want to of things that, that people, you know, particularly in higher ed, you start talking to people who are new to using technology or leadership or management, and they're totally clueless where to start. And we don't train people well. And then suddenly they're no longer in that role and they're thankful they're not. And so they haven't really learned anything. And so the organization doesn't progress on those basic everyday practices that enable us to do our basic work and then use the technology more effectively too. So that's my two cents on on what you have to say. And I, I love the diagram. I think it's really great. I know some organ other organizations are talking about digital transformation that aren't higher ed and our businesses. And I'm going to share that and say, is this what you think your organization's doing? And what's really going to make that happen? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I think your points are really great, Joyce. And um, the, you know, coming off, have, having been really immersed in the top 10 IT issues project this year, when, when we interviewed the panelists and they talked about what, what are the, the big priorities and issues that they're facing and that they think higher education is going to be facing, a lot of it really was this kind of housekeeping. And they talked a lot about how do we manage the data? 
how do we even know what data we have and 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 how do we govern it how do we think about it so that and that kind of connects to that diagram because i think an important point about that diagram is that that diagram looks like it's this nice ladder right i'm on the bottom rung now i'm going to the second one now i'm going to the third one but really if you were to kind of track the journey that we're on we're sort of at all of those levels at our institutions um and and you know we we kind of try to advance in one level and we realize oh my goodness all this work that we have to go back to the previous level to do and and a lot of it is overlapping so it's it's quite a lot messier than that but i i think you're right you know doing those basics yeah. You know, people don't want to fill out forms in the first place it doesn't matter if it's online or not they're That's not right. going to, they're going to try to circumvent the process so anyway. yeah. You know, Joyce, uh, you being an anthropologist, it would be interesting to hear your points of view on the role of leadership in all this, because, you know, leadership in cultural change seems to be somewhat tricky. If you push too hard or don't push hard enough, you don't hit the right balance, um, things could go askew. Um, and I assume that this is something that you and your colleagues have studied is the role of leadership in things like this. Well, I'm, I'm an anthropologist in training, but I'm a recently retired librarian and higher ed administrator. So my field has really been in librarianship, but that's uh. my additional training has been in anthropology. Um, and so uh, absolutely there are ways to study, you know, you can do ethnographies on the ground of what people actually do. It's very different from what they say they do. Oh yes, oh yes. And people lie, right? They lie all the time about what they do. So surveys don't they, necessarily- they tell, We tell right ourselves, answer. let's put it politely, we tell ourselves stories, right? We, we tell stories that they have elements of truth and elements of fantasy. Yep. Uh, so, so there's, uh, I, and I don't think we give people enough time to learn often in these new roles that they have uh, mm -hmm. because they're very different from being a faculty member or something else. Um, and that it, it's not valued that you be a good administrator or manager of the work. Um, that so by the time somebody does catch on, they're off to the next thing and they're glad not to have to deal with it anymore. And so it, it just puts a lot of pressure on an institution if there's not a lot of value in the management of processes um, and, and making them good. Mm -hmm. You know, people think higher edge isn't a business, and it isn't, but it, there are business practices that really help things work a, a lot more smoothly yeah. that yeah. need to be valued more. And that needs to come from the top and the middle and every which way that you can, because the organizations really struggle if they don't have those good practices. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, great to see you again. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions that are just piling in, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, take a crack at them. And uh, let me bring up one. Uh, this and a couple of these are from people who can't um, uh, can't do video right now. So let me bring up uh, uh, one from uh, Nicole Weber. Just she's excited to hear that EduCause is working on materials to support digital transformation work from both sides of the house. Any sneak peeks? Well, yeah, I mean, we have some stuff stockpiled and Brian, I sent you some URLs. Um, yeah, that, if you're gonna post those, um, those that's a way of beginning to get, that's kind of a hub we have where you'll find the signals document that Susan was alluding to um, that is sort of, you know, these are the characteristics of transformation. Do, do any of these apply to you? Or that's a good way to get a sense as to whether, what level of things that you're working on. But that's one place to start. Yeah, and I, I pasted in uh, the URLs to our two kind of foundational documents that we have published right now. Right. And one is uh, a, a document that talks about the shifts that we're seeing in culture, workforce, technology in some level of detail. And then the other one is the one that Malcolm mentioned, the signals document. And the signals document is just this nice uh, uh, a summary of it that's organized in checklist format that you could actually, you know, read and, and you could walk through, you know, or even use it in, in, you know, conversations at your institution to see the extent to which you're seeing the signals already. Yeah, you know, the, the signals document, our motivation for doing that is that when you talk to people and say, are you moving into this sort of space at your institution? And they'll say, yeah, we're starting to recycle or yeah, we just got a new SIS or something like that. And you kind of say, okay, somehow there's a frame that the, the frame is wrong and so we're hoping by means of the signals document to try to see if this is a way of helping people to see kind of what frame they're in whether they're one of the two preliminary d's or whether they're really 
as an institution moving more into the transformational domain. Well, and we have the please. other sneak preview that, that I can give you is we, we just collected some data on digital transformation, uh, about almost 300, I think, uh, people, uh, college and university CIOs and, and IT leaders responded to the survey. And we were, it's, it's a landscape study. And what I mean by that is we're just trying to get the lay of the land of what is really happening today with digital transformation, how much of it is hype and how much of it is reality. Um, why are people engaging in digital transformation, et cetera? So one of the questions we, and, and we were very careful to give those three definitions of digital transformation, digitalization, and digitization. So that people weren't responding to our questions about digital transformation um, and misconstruing it. So uh, we, we were real careful about that. And and one of the things that we asked was, we said, you know, are you doing digital transformation now? Um, remembering that it is uh, this series of deep and coordinated culture, workforce, and technology shifts in uh, uh, in service of trying to develop new educational and operating models and transform the institution. Um, and so with that sample, 13% uh, said yes, they're doing digital transformation today. And you would think I would just find that very depressing, but actually um, I was encouraged to see that because that suggested to me that they had really answered the question. Um, but another 32% said they're in the process of developing a digital transformation strategy, and 37% said they're exploring. So if you're quick at math, um, you can see that 16% said nothing, they're not doing anything at all. So um, that, that's, that's really pretty cool. Um, and we found that the, the top um, benefit of digital transformation that people see today, 84%, said that they believe that digital transformation can help improve the student experience. Um, so that's that's really the top one right now. That's very optimistic. That's good. Yeah. Um, we have a um, we have a question from Ed Gray. Um, this is a text question. Let me just read this out from the chat. Um, he says, one digital transformation that I continue to look forward for schools to significantly make ubiquitous is enriching the student experience, both campus life residential and virtual, as well as in the classrooms, residential, online, and, in, and blended. For instance, campus information and services need to fit our students' pockets. Likewise, as teachers, we should strive to substantially increase the level of engagement interaction with students. Again, that kind of, that kind of circles back to this theme of um, anchoring digital transformation on students, really. Yeah, again, my, 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 my point was that it's probably going to be most conspicuous in the student area. And I would be interested if there was some way to do a poll here, I would want to do it, would be to say, in the think of your institution for the past 10 years. Do you think that your institution has become more uh, student centric over these past 10 years or not? Uh, I would wager that most institutions would say that they have. So I think that there is um, there's powerful momentum in this direction, um, kind of already. Um, it's a good question. Let me see if we can put up um, uh, a quick polling tool um, to do that right now. Um, while um, while this is up, let me just um, um, uh, raise another uh, question, uh, which is from uh, the wonderful uh, Roxanne Riskin, another longtime friend of the uh, program. Uh, and she asked, apart from students, what do you see as faculty's specific or general role in facilitating digital transformation at the university? I think, I think that the, the faculty's biggest contribution would be to um, sort of think more like a student in the sense of adopting uh, learning engagements and learning designs that are really focused on helping the learners of all types and support multimodal uh, course designs. Um, I think, and I think, again, I think I see a lot of, of momentum there. I mean, just think about the design of classrooms over the past five or six years. We've seen a, a, a tremendous shift away from you know continuing to, turn out these transmission style rooms into active learning spaces. 
And I think that's un informed by, I think everybody acknowledges that the act of learning is probably the single most effective mode of learning. And therefore the things around the learning need to support that mode of learning. Um, and I see uh, adoption of uh, adaptive courseware, for example, as one uh, symptom or signal, if you will, um, as a way of trying to um, kind of aspire to Benjamin Bloom's challenge, you know, the, the Two Sigma challenge in uh, providing tutorial and mentoring type experiences, but on a broader scale that uh, higher ed is, is forced to. So I think uh, faculty, as ever, have a huge role in that. If you all can see the, uh, uh, the vote slide up here, the vote object, um, Malcolm, your question was, it was a binary question, right? Yeah, it was, I mean, do you think that you're, that something like this, do you think your institution has become more student-centric and more student-friendly, however you want to phrase it, over the past, say, 10 years? And um, so far, it looks like, um, here, let me see if I can, uh, Let's see if I can get the results. It looks like we've got a huge result. It's only like 98% more. Um, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like 98% or so said more rather than, uh, and only 2% said less. Okay, so the question here is, in terms of your institution's progress in this area, is it sufficient? Is it going to, is it proceeding at a pace and at a volume, so to speak, that will allow your institution to really address the significant headwinds it might be facing. So that's one way of calibrating what the institution needs to do in order to be successful in the 21st century. Can you type that maybe in the chat room, Malcolm? Because uh, you, we, we had another another blip. Okay. It may be that uh, you're getting way too much rain. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but speaking of, uh, of, of too much rain, um, we're right at the end of our hour right now. Um, which is kind of astonishing, and I think a testimony both to the rich and breadth, the breadth and richness of uh, of your model, uh, Susan and Malcolm, as well as the generosity of your responses to uh, all of our many questions. Um, let me let me thank you uh, so much for both uh, sharing this innovative idea um, and also for taking such time to engage with us uh, really deeply. We really appreciate all of that. Thank you. This Thank you. Was so much fun. You know, it, it was great that we just talked um, and that we had a single slide. Uh, so so thanks very much for um, for letting us do that. And thank you all for being so thoughtful. Uh, please don't be strangers. Um, you know, reach out to Malcolm and me uh, with if you have additional thoughts about digital transformation, if you want to get involved, um, if you want to push back on any of this, too. What's the best way to find you? And what's the best way to keep up with all this? Um, the best way to keep up with all this would go, be to go to that um, that URL mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. typed in, uh, Brian, uh, mm -hmm. or you could just Google Educa's digital transformation. Um, that's probably the easiest thing. And then Malcolm and I just put uh, our emails in the um, in, right. in the chat. So if you know Malcolm's Malcolm's name is easy to spell my last name is easy to misspell um, so it works, it works like a charm Gryak is easy and uh -huh. Brian if, if I could just throw in one real quick plug we run a blog called transforming higher ed it's kind of approaching this thing from the teaching and learning side so if anyone is interested in blogging about this or other things um, related to teaching and learning in higher ed just send me a pop me an email great uh, thank you Malcolm uh, thank you, both of you, and uh, thank you especially to the uh, forum community for such great, thoughtful questions and, and consideration. But don't go yet. I just need to introduce where we're going for the next week. Um, next week, we're going to shift ground a little bit, and we're going to welcome the, one of the leading presidents in the liberal education world. Michael Roth, who's the president of Wesleyan University, will join us. He's a, a brilliant instructor, a brilliant thinker, uh, just a, a terrific, terrific person to have. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And the topic is, what's going to happen with liberal education? What's the fate of liberal arts colleges in the 21st century? Please join us. Um, now, that session, this session, all of these sessions are recorded and up on YouTube. So if you'd like to look at some of our past sessions, including Susan's previous appearance or any other discussion on the different topics that we've been touching on, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Now, if you want to keep talking about all this great stuff, I mean, how do we facilitate digital transformation? What does it mean for students? What does it mean for faculty? What does it mean for policy? 
We have a lot of different venues for discussing this. We have groups on LinkedIn and Facebook. On Twitter, we use the hashtag FTTE, and we have a Slack channel. And it would be just great to see all of you there. In the meantime, thank you so much for all your conversation, for all of your thoughts. This has been a really, really great forum. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next time. And I'll be here for about another five minutes if you just want to chat. Until then, bye-bye.